Okay, so next up we have Sarah Kendallin. Give her a round of applause, please. Sarah comes to you today from Monterey, California. She is an actor, a writer, and a senior research analyst in psychometrics. If you don't know what psychometrics is, don't worry, but there'll be a test on that at the end of the show. Hello. Good evening. <laughs> Humans are weird. And their behavior is even weirder. There's a lot of choices that humans make that are hard to explain. We choose to drink water out of bottles, even though water is everywhere. We are making diet choices based on their transportability. And we are living in increasingly smaller dwellings. We asked ourselves, what explanation could possibly tie all of these behaviors together? Mimicry. Now, mimicry in nature serves to protect against predators or to gain some sort of advantage. In the case of humans, we're no longer threatened by many predators. So why are humans exhibiting these odd changes in behavior? We propose that there's a population of humans that are mimicking the domestic hamster. <laughs> and today, I'll explain how that is. Humans' ability to mimic relies heavily on their exposure to an animal. Let's look at the trends. In 1995, 1% of people had hamsters. In 2001, it was 2%. If we extrapolate this doubling trend, <laughs> it was 4% in 2013, 8% in 2018, and is fast approaching 15% by now. We took this exponential growth model and calculated the likelihood of interspecies imprinting taking effect on humans given their age at which they owned or were exposed to hamsters and the likelihood of them subconsciously following through with the learned behavior later on in life. Unfortunately, I don't have time to get into the details at this moment. The results tables are presented in the paper, so let's move on. <laughs> Water bottles were a necessity in the domestic hamster's environment, and they were hung upside down and attached to the wire-framed walls. A small ball bearing in the spout clinked every time the hamster drank, much like a bell. We suspect that humans experienced a quasi-Pavlov's dog phenomenon where they began to associate the sound of a hamster drinking with thirst and would go in search of their own water bottle. After so many reiterations of this, they began to associate, they began to prefer drinking from a bottle. The behavioral adjustment to eat raw, unshelled nuts, rolled oats, and puffed rice is a dietary choice that has become so prominent among humans that many of them have taken to traveling with this food and storing it in square blocks held together by honey or syrup. This is most likely a species adaptation, as humans lack the large cheek pouches of hamsters. It has been observed that humans between the ages of 18 to 34 have sought out living quarters 100 to 400 square feet. These dimensions are congruent to the less than one square foot environment of the domestic hamster. However, they are in stark contrast to the older generations of humans who seek out living quarters 400 plus square feet. And for a moment, we were concerned that this contradicted our theory. Thankfully, upon further study, we found that the age ranges coincide with the exponential growth model of hamster ownership. A 30-year-old today would have been eight years old in 1995, and the ideal age for interspecies imprinting. <laughs> now, when we observe these adjustments in natural behavior, we want to find out how deeply rooted this environmental mimicry has become, which might help us verify it. 
We can't take humans living in small apartments and put collars on them with mini cameras and GPS locators so as to observe them continually for obvious moral, ethical, and privacy issues. So instead, we're forced to rely on more contemporary observations which, to find supporting evidence. And what we've found are numerous examples of the hamster environment crossing over into the human domain. Exhibit A. <laughs> Exhibit B. In fact, the hamster's <laughs> natural burrowing tendencies may have already translated to our underground transportation systems. And finally, the hamster ball. <laughs> There's no good past or present scientific studies documenting that a species exhibiting environmental or behavioral mimicry will eventually lead to evolutionary adaptations. But that being said, it doesn't mean that we reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis either. Therefore, if you find yourself exhibiting any of these aforementioned behaviors, here is your takeaway from today's presentation. Fake it till you make it. <laughs> First question is from Katie. Hi, uh, so you said that uh, this mimicry comes about from some other uh, mechanism that, that is not having to do with being threatened by predators and, and you know, trying to, to camouflage, um, but, it, but it is documented that, uh, you know, that cute babies are sometimes cute because that's something that will cause their parents to, you know, protect them. And I'm wondering if you could comment on the possibility that humans are evolving to be more hamster-like as a way to evade predators and, and to, um, to survive through uh, emulating the cuteness of hamsters. We did look into what the benefits of mimicking a hamster may or may not be. The cuteness factor is a, dependent upon the size of the hamster. Either the smaller it is, the cuter it is uh, it tends to be, or the fatter. And so we do believe that humans have possibly taken on choices based on those factors. That's true. Uh, next question from Gail. Um, so one of the risks of uh, species that rely on imprinting is that there's a possibility of misimprinting on, um, on the wrong species. And, and you're suggesting that that has, has been happening here to some extent. So um, one of the riskiest cases is species that exhibit sexual imprinting, where they learn um, what their mates are supposed to look like when they're young. And I'm wondering, I know hamsters have very potent um, pheromones, and I'm just wondering if you have any concerns or... Have you detected any evidence of, of this? I wouldn't say that we have any concerns. I actually think that we are in a great ge geographical location. The Castro District is prone to find <laughs> mimicking behavior in many species <laughs> during our mating season. It's true. Maggie? So obviously you have found a, some very important behaviors in humans that must be explained by animal mimicry. But I'm concerned that your research chose, pre-selected the species and fit your data to that hamster bias. <laughs> and I, I want to know whether you have run any of these, any of your simulations, any of your data, past the possibility of humans mimicking, I don't know, guinea pigs, chinchillas, or, or God forbid, gerbils. <laughs> That's a great question. We did look into guinea pigs and gerbils, as well as cats and dogs. Now, guinea pigs and gerbils, I just want to say that gerbils tend to be skitter, more faster, and however, they are not as good as escape artists as hamsters. And guinea pigs do tend to be fatter and larger. We didn't consider them to be perfect variables in this situation because they also lack the large cheek pouches. In the case of cats and dogs, if you may, we also considered that since more people own cats and dogs, wouldn't we be mimicking them? However, we found that since we bring them into our environment, they are more likely to mimic us, such as your dog watching television or your cat sleeping in until noon on Sundays. 
All right, round of applause.